Chapter 2 The Story Begins I told some of you last Thursday of the principles of the time machine and showed you the actual thing itself, incomplete, in the workshop. There it is now, a little travel-worn, truly, and one of the ivory bars is cracked and a brass rail bent, but the rest of it's sound enough. I expected to finish it on Friday, but on Friday, when the putting together was nearly done, I found that one of the nickel bars was exactly one inch too short, and this I had to get remade, so that the thing was not complete until this morning. It was at ten o'clock today that the first of all time machines began its career. I gave it a last tap, tried all the screws again, put one more drop of oil on the quartz rod, and sat myself in the saddle. I suppose a suicide who holds a pistol to his skull feels much the same wonder at what will come next as I felt then. I took the starting lever in one hand and the stopping one in the other, pressed the first and almost immediately the second. I seemed to reel. I felt a nightmare sensation of falling and, looking round, I saw the laboratory exactly as before. Had anything happened? For a moment I suspected that my intellect had tricked me, then I noted the clock. A moment before, as it seemed, it had stood at a minute or so past ten, and now it was nearly half past three. I drew a breath, set my teeth, gripped the starting lever with both hands, and went off with a thud. The laboratory got hazy and went dark. Mrs. Watchett came in and walked, apparently without seeing me, towards the garden door. I suppose it took her a minute or so to traverse the place, but to me she seemed to shoot across the room like a rocket. I pressed the lever over to its extreme position. The night came like the turning out of a lamp, and in another moment came tomorrow. The laboratory grew faint and hazy, then fainter and even fainter. Tomorrow night came black, then day again, night again, day again, faster and faster still. An eddying murmur filled my ears and a strange, dumb confusedness descended on my mind. I'm afraid I cannot convey the peculiar sensations of time travelling. They are excessively unpleasant. There is a feeling exactly like that one has upon a switchback of a helpless, headlong motion. I felt the same horrible anticipation, too, of an imminent smash. As I put on pace, night followed day like the flapping of a black wing. The dim suggestion of the laboratory seemed presently to fall away from me, and I saw the sun hopping swiftly across the sky, leaping it every minute, and every minute marking a day. I suppose the laboratory had been destroyed, and I had come into the open air. I had a dim impression of scaffolding, but I was already going too fast to be conscious of any moving things. The slowest snail that ever crawled dashed by too fast for me. The twinkling succession of darkness and light was excessively painful to the eye. Then, in the intermittent darknesses, I saw the moon spinning swiftly through her quarters from new to full and had a faint glimpse of the circling stars. Presently, as I went on, still gaining velocity, the palpitation of night and day merged into one continuous greyness. The sky took on a wonderful deepness of blue, a splendid, luminous colour like that of early twilight. The jerking sun became a streak of fire, a brilliant arch in space. The moon, a fainter fluctuating band, and I could see nothing of the stars, save now and then a brighter circle flickering in the blue. The landscape was misty and vague. I was still on the hillside upon which this house now stands, and the shoulder rose above me grey and dim. I saw trees growing and changing like puffs of vapour, now brown, now green, they grew, spread, shivered and passed away. I saw huge buildings rise up faint and fair and pass like dreams. The whole surface of the earth seemed changed, melting and flowing under my eyes. The little hands upon the dials that registered my speed raced round faster and faster. Presently, I noted that the sunbelt swayed up and down from solstice to solstice in a minute or less, and that consequently my pace was over a year a minute, and minute by minute the white snow flashed across the world and vanished and was followed by the brief, brief green of spring. 
The unpleasant sensations of the start were less poignant now. They merged at last into a kind of hysterical exhilaration. I remarked, indeed, a clumsy swaying of the machine for which I was unable to account, but my mind was too confused to attend to it, so with a kind of madness growing upon me, I flung myself into futurity. At first, I scarce thought of stopping, scarce thought of anything but these new sensations, but presently a fresh series of impressions grew up in my mind, a certain curiosity, and therewith a certain dread, until at last they took complete possession of me. What strange developments of humanity, what wonderful advances upon our rudimentary civilization, I thought, might not appear when I came to look nearly into the dim, elusive world that raced and fluctuated before my eyes. I saw great and splendid architecture rising about me, more massive than any buildings of our own time, and yet, as it seemed, built of glimmer and mist. I saw a richer green flow up the hillside and remain there without any wintry intermission. Even through the veil of my confusion, the earth seemed very fair. And so my mind came round to the business of stopping. The peculiar risk lay in the possibility of my finding some substance in the space which I or the machine occupied. So long as I travelled at a high velocity through time, this scarcely mattered. I was, so to speak, attenuated, was slipping like a vapour through the interstices of intervening substances. But to come to a stop involved the jamming of myself, molecule by molecule, into whatever lay in my way, meant bringing my atoms into such intimate contact with those of the obstacle that a profound chemical reaction possibly a far-reaching explosion would result and blow myself and my apparatus out of all possible dimensions into the unknown. This possibility had occurred to me again and again while I was making the machine, but then I had cheerfully accepted it as an unavoidable risk, one of the risks a man has got to take. Now the risk was inevitable, I no longer saw it in that same cheerful light. The fact is that, insensibly, the absolute strangeness of everything, the sickly jarring and swaying of the machine, above all, the feeling of prolonged falling had absolutely upset my nerve. I told myself that I could never stop, and with a gust of petulance I resolved to stop forthwith. Like an impatient fool, I lugged over the lever, and incontinently the thing went reeling over, and I was flung headlong through the air. There was the sound of a clap of thunder in my ears. I may have been stunned for a moment. A pitiless hail was hissing round me and I was sitting on soft turf in front of the overset machine. Everything still seemed grey but presently I remarked that the confusion in my ears was gone. I looked round me. I was on what seemed to be a little lawn in a garden, surrounded by rhododendron bushes, and I noticed that their mauve and purple blossoms were dropping in a shower under the beating of the hailstones. The rebounding, dancing hail hung in a cloud over the machine and drove along the ground like smoke. In a moment I was wet to the skin. Fine hospitality, said I, to a man who has travelled innumerable years to see you. Presently, I thought what a fool I was to get wet. I stood up and looked round me. A colossal figure, carved apparently in some white stone, loomed indistinctly beyond the rhododendrons through the hazy downpour. But all else of the world was invisible. My sensations would be hard to describe. As the columns of hail grew thinner, I saw the white figure more distinctly. It was very large, for a silver birch tree touched its shoulder. It was of white marble, in shape something like a winged sphinx, but the wings, instead of being carried vertically at the sides, were spread so that it seemed to hover. The pedestal, it appeared to me, was of bronze and was thick with verdigris. It chanced that the face was towards me, the sightless eyes seemed to watch me. There was the faint shadow of a smile on the lips. It was greatly weather-worn, and that imparted an unpleasant suggestion of disease. I stood looking at it for a little space, half a minute perhaps, or half an hour. It seemed to advance and to recede as the hail drove before it denser or thinner. At last I tore my eyes from it for a moment and saw that the hail curtain had worn threadbare, and that the sky was lightening with the promise of the sun. 
I looked up again at the crouching white shape, and the full temerity of my voyage came suddenly upon me. What might appear when that hazy curtain was altogether withdrawn? What might not have happened to men? What if cruelty had grown into a common passion? What if in this interval the race had lost its manliness and had developed into something inhuman, unsympathetic, and overwhelmingly powerful? I might seem some old-world savage animal, only the more dreadful and disgusting for our common likeness, a foul creature to be incontinently slain. Already I saw other vast shapes, huge buildings with intricate parapets and tall columns, with a wooded hillside dimly creeping in upon me through the lessening storm. I was seized with a panic fear. I turned frantically to the time machine and strove hard to readjust it. As I did so, the shafts of the sun smoked through the thunderstorm. The grey downpour was swept aside and vanished like the trailing garments of a ghost. Above me, in the intense blue of the summer sky, some faint brown shreds of cloud whirled into nothingness. The great buildings about me stood out clear and distinct, shining with the wet of the thunderstorm, and picked out in white by the unmelted hailstones piled along their courses. I felt naked in a strange world. I felt as perhaps a bird may feel in the clear air, knowing the hawk wings above and will swoop. My fear grew to frenzy. I took a breathing space, set my teeth, and again grappled fiercely wrist and knee with the machine. It gave under my desperate onset and turned over. It struck my chin violently. One hand on the saddle, the other on the lever, I stood, panting heavily in attitude to mount again. But with this recovery of a prompt retreat, my courage recovered. I looked more curiously and less fearfully at this world of the remote future. In a circular opening high up in the wall of the nearer house, I saw a group of figures clad in rich, soft robes. They had seen me, and their faces were directed towards me. Then I heard voices approaching me. Coming through the bushes by the white sphinx were the heads and shoulders of men running. One of these emerged in a pathway leading straight to the little lawn upon which I stood with my machine. He was a slight creature, perhaps four feet high, clad in a purple tunic, girdled at the waist with a leather belt. Sandals, or buckskins, I could not clearly distinguish which, were on his feet. His legs were bare to the knees, and his head was bare. Noticing that, I noticed for the first time how warm the air was. He struck me as being a very beautiful and graceful creature, but indescribably frail. His flushed face reminded me of the more beautiful kind of consumptive that hectic beauty of which we used to hear so much. At the sight of him, I suddenly regained confidence. I took my hands from the machine. In another moment, we were standing face to face. I and this fragile thing out of futurity. He came straight up to me and laughed into my eyes. The absence from his bearing of any sign of fear struck me at once. Then he turned to the two others who were following him and spoke to them in a strange and very sweet and liquid tongue. There were others coming, and presently a little group of perhaps eight or ten of these exquisite creatures were about me. One of them addressed me. It came into my head, oddly enough, that my voice was too harsh and deep for them. So I shook my head and, pointing to my ears, shook it again. He came a step forward, hesitated, and then touched my hand. Then I felt other soft little tentacles upon my back and shoulders. They wanted to make sure I was real. There was nothing in this at all alarming. Indeed, there was something in these pretty little people that inspired confidence, a graceful gentleness, a certain childlike ease. And besides... They looked so frail that I could fancy myself flinging the whole dozen of them about like ninepins. But I made a sudden motion to warn them when I saw their little pink hands feeling at the time machine. Happily then, when it was not too late, I thought of a danger I had hitherto forgotten. 
and reaching over the bars of the machine, I unscrewed the little levers that would set it in motion and put these in my pocket. Then I turned again to see what I could do in the way of communication. And then, looking more nearly into their features, I saw some further peculiarities in their Dresden China type of prettiness. Their hair, which was uniformly curly, came to a sharp end at the neck and cheek. There was not the faintest suggestion of it on the face, and their ears were singularly minute. Their mouths were small, with bright red, rather thin lips, and the little chins ran to a point. The eyes were large and mild, and, this may seem egotism on my part, I fancied even that there was a certain lack of the interest I might have expected in them. As they made no effort to communicate with me, but simply stood round me smiling and speaking in soft cooing notes to each other, I began the conversation. I pointed to the time machine and to myself. Then, hesitating for a moment how to express time, I pointed to the sun. At once, a quaintly pretty little figure in checkered purple and white followed my gesture, and then astonished me by imitating the sound of thunder. For a moment I was staggered, though the import of his gestures was plain enough. The question had come into my mind abruptly. Were these creatures fools? You may hardly understand how it took me. You see, I had always anticipated that the people of the year 802,000-odd would be incredibly in front of us in knowledge, art, everything. Then one of them suddenly asked me a question that showed him to be on the intellectual level of one of our five-year-old children. Asked me, in fact, if I had come from the sun in a thunderstorm. It let loose the judgment I had suspended upon their clothes, their frail light limbs and fragile features. A flow of disappointment rushed across my mind. For a moment I felt that I had built the time machine in vain. I nodded, pointed to the sun and gave them such a vivid rendering of a thunderclap as startled them. They all withdrew a pace or so and bowed. Then came one laughing towards me, carrying a chain of beautiful flowers, altogether new to me, and put it about my neck. The idea was received with melodious applause, and presently they were all running to and fro for flowers and laughingly flinging them upon me, until I was almost smothered with blossom. You, who have never seen the like, can scarcely imagine what delicate and wonderful flowers countless years of culture had created. Then someone suggested that their plaything should be exhibited in the nearest building, and so I was led past the sphinx of white marble, which had seemed to watch me all the while with a smile at my astonishment, towards a vast grey edifice of fretted stone. As I went with them, the memory of my confident anticipations of a profoundly grave and intellectual posterity came, with irresistible merriment, to my mind. The building had a huge entry, and was altogether of colossal dimensions. I was naturally most occupied with the growing crowd of little people, and with the big open portals that yawned before me, shadowy and mysterious. My general impression of the world I saw over their heads was a tangled waste of beautiful bushes and flowers, a long-neglected and yet weedless garden. I saw a number of tall spikes of strange white flowers measuring a foot, perhaps, across the spread of the waxen petals. They grew scattered, as if wild, among the variegated shrubs, but, as I say, I did not examine them closely at this time. The time machine was left deserted on the turf among the rhododendrons. The arch of the doorway was richly carved, but naturally I did not observe the carvings very narrowly, though I fancied I saw suggestions of old Phoenician decorations as I passed through, and it struck me that they were very badly broken and weather-worn. Several more brightly clad people met me in the doorway, and so we entered, I dressed in dingy nineteenth-century garments, looking grotesque enough, garlanded with flowers and surrounded by an eddying mass of bright, soft-coloured robes and shining white limbs in a melodious whirl of laughter and laughing speech. The big doorway opened into a proportionately great hall hung with brown. The roof was in shadow, and the windows, partially glazed with coloured glass and partially unglazed, admitted a tempered light. 
The floor was made up of huge blocks of some very hard white metal, not plates nor slabs, blocks. And it was so much worn, as I judged by the going to and fro of past generations, as to be deeply channeled along the more frequented ways. Transverse to the length were innumerable tables made of slabs of polished stone, raised perhaps a foot from the floor, and upon these were heaps of fruits. Some I recognized as a kind of hypertrophied raspberry and orange, but for the most part they were strange. Between the tables was scattered a great number of cushions. Upon these, my conductors seated themselves, signing for me to do likewise. With a pretty absence of ceremony, they began to eat the fruit with their hands, flinging peel and stalks and so forth into the round openings in the sides of the tables. I was not loath to follow their example, for I felt thirsty and hungry. As I did so, I surveyed the hall at my leisure. And perhaps the thing that struck me most was its dilapidated look. The stained glass windows, which displayed only a geometrical pattern, were broken in many places, and the curtains that hung across the lower end were thick with dust. And it caught my eye that the corner of the marble table near me was fractured. Nevertheless, the general effect was extremely rich and picturesque. There were perhaps a couple of hundred people dining in the hall, and most of them, seated as near to me as they could come, were watching me with interest, their little eyes shining over the fruit they were eating. All were clad in the same soft and yet strong silky material. Fruit, by the by, was all their diet. These people of the remote future were strict vegetarians, and while I was with them, in spite of some carnal cravings, I had to be frugivorous also. Indeed, I found afterwards that horses, cattle, sheep, dogs had followed the ichthyosaurus into extinction. But the fruits were very delightful. One in particular that seemed to be in season all the time I was there, a flowery thing in a three-sided husk, was especially good, and I made it my staple. At first, I was puzzled by all these strange fruits and by the strange flowers I saw, but later I began to perceive their import. However, I am telling you of my fruit dinner in the distant future now. So soon as my appetite was a little checked, I determined to make a resolute attempt to learn the speech of these new men of mine. Clearly, that was the next thing to do. The fruits seemed a convenient thing to begin upon, and holding one of these up, I began a series of interrogative sounds and gestures. I had some considerable difficulty in conveying my meaning. At first, my efforts met with a stare of surprise or inextinguishable laughter. But presently, a fair-haired little creature seemed to grasp my intention and repeated a name. They had to chatter and explain the business at great length to each other, and my first attempts to make the exquisite little sounds of their language caused an immense amount of amusement. However, I felt like a schoolmaster amidst children and persisted, and presently I had a score of noun substantives at least at my command. And then I got to demonstrative pronouns and even the verb to eat. But it was slow work and the little people soon tired and wanted to get away from my interrogations, so I determined, rather of necessity, to let them give their lessons in little doses when they felt inclined. And very little doses I found they were before long, for I never met people more indolent or more easily fatigued. A queer thing I soon discovered about my little hosts, and that was their lack of interest. They would come to me with eager cries of astonishment, like children. But like children, they would soon stop examining me and wander away after some other toy. The dinner and my conversational beginnings ended, I noted, for the first time, that almost all those who had surrounded me at first were gone. It is odd, too, how speedily I came to disregard these little people. I went out through the portal into the sunlit world again as soon as my hunger was satisfied. I was continually meeting more of these men of the future who would follow me a little distance, chatter and laugh about me, and, having smiled and gesticulated in a friendly way, leave me again to my own devices. The calm of evening was upon the world as I emerged from the great hall, and the scene was lit by the warm glow of the setting sun. 
At first, things were very confusing. Everything was so entirely different from the world I had known, even the flowers. The big building I had left was situated on the slope of a broad river valley, but the Thames had shifted perhaps a mile from its present position. I resolved to mount to the summit of a crest, perhaps a mile and a half away, from which I could get a wider view of this our planet in the year 802,701 AD. For that, I should explain, was the date the little dials of my machine recorded. As I walked, I was watching for every impression that could possibly help to explain the condition of ruinous splendor in which I found the world, for ruinous it was. A little way up the hill, for instance, was a great heap of granite, bound together by masses of aluminium, a vast labyrinth of precipitous walls and crumpled heaps, amidst which were thick heaps of very beautiful pagoda-like plants, nettles, possibly, but wonderfully tinted with brown about the leaves and incapable of stinging. It was, evidently, the derelict remains of some vast structure, to what end built I could not determine. It was here that I was destined at a later date to have a very strange experience, the first intimation of a still stranger discovery but of that I will speak in its proper place. Looking round with a sudden thought, from a terrace on which I rested for a while, I realized that there were no small houses to be seen. Apparently, the single house, and possibly even the household, had vanished. Here and there among the greenery were palace-like buildings, but the house and the cottage, which form such characteristic features of our own English landscape, had disappeared. Communism, said I to myself. And on the heels of that came another thought. I looked at the half-dozen little figures that were following me. Then, in a flash, I perceived that all had the same form of costume, the same soft, hairless visage, and the same girlish rotundity of limb. It may seem strange, perhaps, that I had not noticed this before, but everything was so strange. Now I saw the fact plainly enough. In costume, and in all the differences of texture and bearing that now mark off the sexes from each other, these people of the future were alike, and the children seemed to my eyes to be but the miniatures of their parents. I judged, then, that the children of that time were extremely precocious, physically at least, and I found afterwards abundant verification of my opinion. Seeing the ease and security in which these people were living, I felt that this close resemblance of the sexes was, after all, what one would expect. For the strength of a man and the softness of a woman, the institution of the family, and the differentiation of occupations are mere militant necessities of an age of physical force, where population is balanced and abundant. Much childbearing becomes an evil rather than a blessing to the state, where violence comes but rarely and offspring are secure. There is less necessity, indeed there is no necessity, for an efficient family, and the specialization of the sexes with reference to their children's needs disappears. We see some beginnings of this even in our time, and in this future age it was complete. This, I must remind you, was my speculation at the time. Later... I was to appreciate how far it fell short of the reality. While I was musing upon these things, my attention was attracted by a pretty little structure like a well under a cupola. I thought in a transitory way of the oddness of wells still existing, and then resumed the thread of my speculations. There were no large buildings towards the top of the hill, and as my walking powers were evidently miraculous, I was presently left alone for the first time. With a strange sense of freedom and adventure, I pushed up to the crest. There I found a seat of some yellow metal that I did not recognize, corroded in places with a kind of pinkish rust and half smothered in soft moss. The armrests cast and filed in the resemblance of griffins' heads. I sat down on it, and I surveyed the broad view of our old world under the sunset of that long day. It was as sweet and fair a view as I have ever seen. The sun had already gone below the horizon, and the west was flaming gold, touched with some horizontal bars of purple and crimson. Below was the valley of the Thames, in which the river lay like a band of burnished steel. 
I have already spoken of the great palaces dotted about among the variegated greenery, some in ruins and some still occupied. Here and there rose a white or silvery figure in the waste garden of the earth. Here and there came the sharp vertical line of some cupola or obelisk. There were no hedges, no signs of proprietary rights, no evidence of agriculture. The whole earth had become a garden. So watching, I began to put my interpretation upon the things I had seen, and as it shaped itself to me that evening, my interpretation was something in this way. Afterwards, I found I had gotten only a half-truth, or only a glimpse of one facet of the truth. It seemed to me that I had happened upon humanity upon the wane. The ruddy sunset sent me thinking of the sunset of mankind. For the first time, I began to realize an odd consequence of the social effort in which we are at present engaged. And yet, come to think, it is a logical consequence enough. Strength is the outcome of need. Security sets a premium on feebleness. The work of ameliorating the conditions of life, the true civilizing process that makes life more and more secure, had gone steadily on to a climax. One triumph of a united humanity over nature had followed another. Things that are now mere dreams had become projects deliberately put in hand and carried forward, and the harvest was what I saw. After all, the sanitation and the agriculture of today are still in the rudimentary stage. The science of our time has attacked but a little department of the field of human disease, but even so, it spreads its operations very steadily and persistently. Our agriculture and horticulture destroy a weed just here and there, and cultivating perhaps a score or so of wholesome plants, leaving the greater number to fight out a balance as they can. We improve our favorite plants and animals, and how few they are, gradually by selective breeding. Now a new and better peach, now a seedless grape, now a sweeter and larger flower, now a more convenient breed of cattle. We improve them gradually because our ideals are vague and tentative, and our knowledge is very limited. Because nature too is shy and slow in our clumsy hands. Someday, all this will be better organized and still better. That is the drift of the current in spite of the eddies. The whole world will be intelligent, educated and cooperating. Things will move faster and faster towards the subjugation of nature. In the end, wisely and carefully, we shall readjust the balance of human and vegetable life to suit our human needs. This adjustment, I say, must have been done, and done well, done indeed for all time, in the space of time across which my machine had leaped. The air was free from gnats, the earth from weeds or fungi, everywhere were fruits and sweet and delightful flowers. Brilliant butterflies flew hither and thither. The ideal of preventative medicine was attained. Diseases had been stamped out. I saw no evidence of any contagious diseases during all my stay. And I shall have to tell you later that even the processes of putrefaction and decay had been profoundly affected by these changes. Social triumphs, too, had been affected. I saw mankind housed in splendid shelters, gloriously clothed, and as yet I had found them engaged in no toil. There were no signs of struggle, neither social nor economical struggle. The shop, the advertisement, traffic, all that commerce which constitutes the body of our world was gone. It was natural on that golden evening that I should jump at the idea of a social paradise. The difficulty of increasing population had been met, I guessed, and population had ceased to increase. But with this change in condition comes inevitably adaptations to the change. What, unless biological science is a mass of errors, is the cause of human intelligence and vigor? Hardship and freedom, conditions under which the active, strong and subtle survive and the weaker go to the wall. Conditions that put a premium upon the loyal alliance of capable men, upon self-restraint, patience and decision. And the institution of the family and the emotions that arise therein, the fierce jealousy, the tenderness for offspring, parental self-devotion. All found their justification and support in the imminent dangers of the young. Now, where are these imminent dangers? 
There is a sentiment arising, and it will grow, against connubial jealousy, against fierce maternity, against passion of all sorts. Unnecessary things now, and things that will make us uncomfortable, savage survivals, discords in a refined and pleasant life. I thought of the physical slightness of the people, their lack of intelligence and those big, abundant ruins, and it strengthened my belief in a perfect conquest of nature. For after the battle comes quiet. Humanity had been strong, energetic, and intelligent, and had used all its abundant vitality to alter the conditions under which it lived, and now came the reaction of the altered conditions. Under the new conditions of perfect comfort and security, that restless energy that with us is strength would become weakness. Even in our own time, certain tendencies and desires, once necessary to survival, are a constant source of failure. Physical courage and the love of battle, for instance, are no great help, but may even be hindrances to a civilized man. And in a state of physical balance and security, power, intellectual as well as physical, would be out of place. For countless years, I judged, there had been no danger of war or solitary violence, no danger from wild beasts, no wasting disease to require strength of constitution, no need of toil. For such a life, what we should call the weak are as well equipped as the strong, and indeed no longer weak. Better equipped indeed they are, for the strong would be fretted by an energy for which there was no outlet. No doubt, the exquisite beauty of the buildings I saw was the outcome of the last surgings of the now purposeless energy of mankind before it settled down into perfect harmony with the conditions under which it lived. The flourish of that triumph which began the last great peace. This has ever been the fate of energy insecurity. It takes to art and to eroticism, and then comes languor and decay. Even this artistic impetus would at last die away, had almost died in the time I saw. To adorn themselves with flowers, to dance, to sing in the sunlight, so much was left of the artistic spirit and no more. Even that would fade in the end into a contented inactivity. We are kept keen on the grindstone of pain and necessity. And it seemed to me that here was that hateful grindstone broken at last. As I stood there in the gathering dark, I thought that in this simple explanation I had mastered the problem of the world, mastered the whole secret of these delicious people. Possibly the checks they had devised for the increase of population had succeeded too well, and their numbers had rather diminished than kept stationary. That would account for the abandoned ruins. Very simple was my explanation, and plausible enough, as most wrong theories are. As I stood there, musing over this too perfect triumph of man, the full moon, yellow and gibbous, came up out of an overflow of silver light in the northeast. The bright little figures ceased to move about below, a noiseless owl flitted by, and I shivered with the chill of the night. I determined to descend and find where I could sleep. I looked for the building I knew. Then my eye travelled along to the figure of the white sphinx upon the pedestal of bronze, growing distinct as the light of the rising moon grew brighter. I could see the silver birch against it. There was the tangle of rhododendron bushes, black in the pale light, and there was the little lawn. I looked at the lawn again. A queer doubt chilled my complacency. No, said I stoutly to myself, that was not the lawn, but it was the lawn for the white leprous face of the Sphinx was towards it. Can you imagine what I felt as this conviction came home to me? But you cannot. The time machine was gone. At once, like a lash across the face, came the possibility of losing my own age, of being left helpless in this strange new world. The bare thought of it was an actual physical sensation. I could feel it grip me at the throat and stop my breathing.